Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful, sunny, warm Sunday morning here at West Alameda Community Baptist Church. The church is eating this wonderful to see all of you this morning as we come together in a holy time of worship and praise. As we begin our time together, I do have some announcements. Um, just an uh, invitation, of course, to join us for Bible study. We are finally getting around to wrapping up the Book of Romans over the next two weeks. Uh, you're, of course, welcome to join us for that. Uh, but then starting on the third Thursday in March, we're going to do a brand new study uh, looking at the woman in the Bible. That's something we've never done. And uh, look forward to doing that. Uh, I think it will be enlightening for all of us. So plan on joining us Thursdays at 3 o'clock in the fire setting with the Bible study. And also an invitation to join us for Talk Back today after worship. We're beginning a new series, uh, He Chose the Nails by Max and Cato. Uh, wonderful series, excellent short videos and some great discussion questions. And Rod has gone really above and beyond and gotten us hostess treats for today. He, I, I opened it up and there was a box of Twinkies. <laughs> and, and there was a box of Ding Dongs. I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> no, they're out there, I promise, I'm sure. They think you'll enjoy it. And, and good coffee, of course, as always. Thank you, Rod. We're going to do uh, uh, refreshments a little bit differently for, for uh, talk back, trying something new to help ease the traffic jams a little bit. We will have the table kind of poured out as you go in, uh, pulled out rather, and you can grab one of those wonderful hostess treats on your way in and just have a seat. We're going to bring coffee around. We're going to serve coffee. That'll, that'll keep the, the congestion and, and, and the worries about carrying around hot coffee to a minimum. So just encourage you to help yourself with some treats, grab a seat, and we will bring coffee around. Yes, Rod. Right. We'll bring the whole coffee. Yes, and just a reminder, we're asking folks if you can get in the habit of bringing your own coffee cup, that's a good environmental choice for us to make, uh, and it will help us wean off styrofoam before we're outlaws at the beginning of next year and become to the in Colorado. So. Uh, a good choice, I think, if you can bring your own coffee cups. We've got coffee <coughs> cups available today, certainly don't worry about it. But if you remember that, bring your own coffee cup, that would be great. And, and a couple of people have asked, no, you will take it home with you as well. We're not going to wash your coffee cup. You <laughs> so we're full service, but there are limits. Uh, Cheryl uh, Stewart and, and Sharon are, uh, Benson are are offering a very special uh, special time, special service, if you will, for uh, our folks and for the community throughout uh, Lent, throughout the season of Lent. They're uh, they're facilitating an evening prayer service every evening, Monday through Saturday, not on Sunday evenings, but Monday through Saturday at 6:30 here in the Centrum. Just a, a time to come together, some uh, prayer time, some liturgy and scripture reading. I encourage you to grow your faith during Lent by joining them. Uh, Mondays through Saturdays at 6.30 in here. Definitely give it a try and see if it's for you. I think you'll be blessed by uh, taking, uh, taking part in that evening prayer service devotional time. As we begin our worship together, I invite you to prepare your hearts, your minds for our time together as we hear these words from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. You did not let my enemies rejoice over me. You have formed me, uh, you have discarded, you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth. You've clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you, and I will never be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as we too come into this holy time of worship, we pray that our hearts may, might not be silent as well. May the Spirit lead us together in praise. May the words we hear and speak, the songs we hear and sing, and the prayers that we offer be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen.
And now, let's remain seated and sing together our call to prayer. You'll find the words on the front page of your bulletin or on the screen. Let's sing together our call to worship, Holy Ground. Put a smile on our faces, turn and greet one another, welcoming all to worship this morning in Christ. Now I invite you to stand as you wish. Let's sing together our opening hymn of praise. You'll find the words and music on the inserts in your bulletin. The words will be on the screen as well. Please stand as you wish as we sing together, Come Thou Almighty King. And we'll do verses 1, 2, and 4 this morning. Come Thou Almighty King. invited us as his children to share our joys, our concerns, to truly share our lives with our Creator as we come before his presence with our joys and concerns. As we enter into our time of uh, prayer, I've got some updates, prayer concerns, and joys uh, for our time together this morning. We ask for ongoing prayers for Polly Allen with health concerns, for Alice Kaur's friend Candy with health concerns as well. For Dee Dameron, uh, her family with uh, health concerns, in particular her sister Linda, we offer prayers for uh, our friend Roddy Gowen, uh, Gadan, rather, who is uh, struggling with health concerns and was not feeling well this morning either. We offer ongoing prayers for our friend Gladys, as she has some concerns as well, Gladys Health. Prayers for Barbara Kleinman with health concerns. 
We had some good news, updates from uh, lesson Ruth Ledford's friend, Barbara Jean's granddaughter. She is improving and has returned back to work. Um, so uh, hopefully on the road to complete healing. We offer prayers for Sherry Preston and Elizabeth Rojas for health concerns. Uh, Rod Smith, we're still continuing in prayer for Brandy, who's waiting for her surgery. For Carol Streeter's granddaughter, Nicole, and her family uh, with health concerns. And for Ronnie Zeiss's granddaughter, Cassandra, with health concerns during her pregnancy. I would also say we offer prayers for our neighbors here at Eaton's, many of whom on the east wing, those four units that are just directly off the elevator, uh, had to uh, evacuate this weekend uh, because of frozen uh, drain lines again. And uh, we pray for several of those folks that they might uh, maybe have a, a relaxing weekend away, but uh, many in hotels, some with family and uh, we, we certainly offer prayers for their comfort and, and situation and, and for their return tomorrow as well. We offer ongoing prayers for the uh, devastating earthquake, the victims of that earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Of course, prayers for our covenant missionary partners, Rick and Anita Gutierrez, as they continue with their work in uh, South Africa. We offer prayers as well for the suffering, the warfare, the tension in the Ukraine region and uh, offer prayers as well as God's children for peace in our world, that we might truly learn as God's children to love and respect one another. Do we have joys or concerns to share as we enter into our time of prayer this morning? Yes, Cindy. My two daughters, Cindy and Connie, they need your prayers. Thank you. Sandy's two daughters, please keep them in your prayers. Yes, Steve. Prayers for the people in California who had that snow. Yes, uh, many feet of snow uh, in the Tetons in California, yeah. I, I, I'm reminded of things when I start whining about our weather every now and then. Yeah, that's, uh, they get a lot of snow there, but that's more than they're used to or are able to handle easily. Yes, Alice. Becky, pray for Becky. Thank you, yeah, Becky yeah. Conger is also not feeling well this morning, so please offer prayers for her. Would also offer prayers for a good friend of, of Leah Brown. She mentioned to me this morning, a good friend of hers who received a very difficult diagnosis uh, and, and is hospitalized. So prayers for her as well. Other joys or concerns this morning in our prayer time? If not, let's remain seated and sing together our call of prayer. You'll find that on the answers in your bulletin or the words are on the screen. Let's remain seated and sing together a sweet hour of prayer, verse 1. time of silent prayer as we lift up the joys and concerns that have been spoken and shared and bring to God as well those unspoken joys and concerns that are on our hearts. Let's come together now in a time of silent prayer. A loving and gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we truly approach your throne in awe and wonder as we see the majesty of your creation, your glory reflected all around us, yet we humbly know how much you love us and invite us to be a part of your glory as well. We thank you, God, for hearing our prayers, those prayers we offer for our friends and neighbors, people who are struggling with issues of health, facing and recovering from surgery. We ask God for your healing touch to be present among them, to, to bless them with comfort and peace. We pray as well for all of the medical professionals who truly spend their lives serving and healing and blessing. Guide their hands, 
Bless their hearts, God. We thank you for the gift of medicine, for the amazing wonders that we enjoy today. We ask as well, God, for your blessings on those facing struggles that we often do not see or choose not to see. So many people, God, whose answer is simply fine when we're asking how they are, yet their lives are filled with challenges and difficulties we don't see. We pray, God, for those who are struggling with addiction and mental health issues, for those, God, whose lives are filled with loneliness and despair, for so many people, God, in our, among our friends and neighbors whose relationships with family and friends are strained or broken. Truly, God, they need your healing as much as anyone. We pray truly for your comforting touch, your blessed presence to be with them. And we ask as well, God, that you might open our eyes, help us see as Jesus would see, and help us love and bless as he would bless. We pray as always, Lord, for our community, our city, our state, our nation. We pray for those who lead us in public and service and elected offices. For those who seek those offices as well, God, we pray truly, pray truly that your wisdom would be poured out upon them. We pray that they might have the courage to make the decisions they need to make and, and that we might have the wisdom to understand what they're doing and when it's best for us as well. We pray, God, for all of those men and women who spend their lives blessing us as police officers, as paramedics and firefighters. Oh Lord, we pray for their safety. We thank you for their spirit of service and sacrifice. And we truly pray that they come home safely to those that they love as their duties end. And we pray for those men and women in our military services as well, as they too offer their lives in service and all too often sacrifice. <clears throat> Protect them, God. Bring them home to those they love. And we pray for our world. We pray for those suffering and struggling in the aftermath of earthquakes, in the aftermath of famine and political oppression. We pray, God, for those who don't have the blessings of the security of home. We pray, God, for those who are hungry and thirsty. We pray, God, for those who truly need to see your love fleshed out in real ways. And we pray, God, that our hearts would be moved to love and to serve those neighbors who live next door to us, but those neighbors who live around the world that we'll never see. And we pray especially, God, that your gospel of peace, the good news of Jesus Christ, might be made available to all people. And we ask for your blessings upon those who give their lives in service of the gospel. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. He reminded us that we're your children and asked that we join together in praying this simple prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I, uh, our scripture lesson today talks about three cities, and we'll talk about that in the message. Um, three cities that were an important part of Jesus' ministry. Uh, Capernaum, um, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. And, and all three of those cities were prominent, wealthy, prosperous cities on the northeast side of, of Lake Galilee. And all three of them today are in ruins. Most of them were destroyed, or two of them at least, were destroyed by, by Rome after the big Judean uprising that ultimately ended in the temple and Jerusalem and Jerusalem itself being destroyed. And the other was destroyed by an earthquake. And it struck me as I was, again this week, looking at some of those pictures and, and remembering the glory that 
lives there in crumbled ruins, that our priorities sometimes are a little bit askew. Jesus taught so often that the only thing that we truly keep are those things that we share, those things that we give. That's the message of our offering. We thank those of you who are able to support the mission and ministries of this church. It blesses us, our community, and our world, I'm convinced. But this time is more than that. This time is your chance to recognize how you have been blessed and how God calls you to be a blessing as well. It's in that spirit I invite our ushers forward as we receive this morning's offering. <laughs> service to that time when we open our hearts, minds, and lives to hearing God's word, I invite you to remain seated. Let's sing together our hymn of preparation. You'll find that on the inserts in your bulletin. The words will be on the screen. Let's remain seated and sing together, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. We will do verses 1, 2, and 4 this morning. Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior.
verse 4. It will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. A loving and gracious God, as your humble servant stands here to proclaim your word, we truly pray that your spirit and word would come through. Help us hear your word and will for us today, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Author George Halleck tells the story of a visit he made to uh, Beethoven's home in Vienna. It's a large apartment that's now been converted into a museum honoring the one who many believe is the greatest composer who ever lived. George was with a, a group of obnoxious and insensitive tourists, something I've had a little experience with myself recently. The tour guide pointed to the piano that Beethoven had used to compose many of his greatest works, including that famous Ninth Symphony. It was a, a specially designed and built instrument. It had an opening in the front so he could access and feel the strings as he played, so he could literally feel the music and the harmonies. He was totally deaf by the end of his life. As the guide was discussing this piano, a, a brash young woman, she turned out to be a music major at a large American university, pushed forward through the group, stepped over the velvet rope, and to the astonishment of everyone, sat down at the piano and began playing a Beethoven sonata, looking at the group to make sure that they were all impressed with her talent. Everyone, including the guide, was just dumbfounded, struck silent at her arrogance. She finished, and when no one applauded, she said, <laughs> I played better sounding pianos than that. But I'm sure other people have sat down and said the same thing. The guide looked at her and said, Madam, in the 27 years I've been leading tour, tours here, no one has dared to sit down <laughs> and play that piano. Two months ago, the famous pianist Vladimir Horowitz was here with the tour group, and they begged him to sit down and play something. He refused. He simply said, I could never. I'm not even worthy to touch the keys. That woman was clearly suffering from an almost fatal case of excessive pride. An observant one writer once, once noted that false pride is the only disease that everyone around the patient suffers from, while the patient, him or herself, doesn't notice anything's wrong, doesn't notice any symptoms at all. It's for a very good reason that the sin of pride has been called the root sin of all sins. Ultimately, it goes beyond thinking more of ourselves than we should. It, it even gets to the point where we begin thinking that we could do a better job of all this than God does. We could kind of be a better God than our Creator is. Jesus, as he begins his final journey to Jerusalem, after he, to quote the verses from Luke chapter 9 we talked about a few weeks ago, had turned his face toward Jerusalem, has some final words about pride and arrogance for the towns that he 
really had most likely spent the most time living in and working in over the previous two or so years. Those three towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, as I mentioned, are all situated within a few miles of each other along those northern shores of Galilee. They all three had a reputation of being successful, sophisticated, wealthier towns than many in that region, including Nazareth, a very poor town where Jesus himself grew up and lived as a young adult. I mentioned on Thursday when I was showing some of my slides that I visited the ruins of Capernaum. Along, it along with those other towns were either destroyed by Rome around 70 AD or, or soon after in an earthquake. That destruction by Rome even resulted in Jerusalem being destroyed and the Holy Temple being torn down. You could see, even when I was there from the archaeological excavations, that it had been a prosperous town. There was a very large synagogue, likely one where Jesus himself would have preached at, at least until his messages weren't welcomed there anymore. Pernium really did serve as Jesus' home base in Galilee. And that made a lot of sense because of one feature Capernaum shared with those other two towns. They were all located on the King's Highway, that main north-south trade route for that region that runs through the eastern Mediterranean. Being in Capernaum not only gave Jesus quick access by boat or on foot to many of the towns around that region of Galilee, it also brought him new audiences to his own door in, in the form of those caravans and travelers who were passing right by town every day. New people to hear his messages of repentance and reconciliation of a kingdom of God that was coming and was nothing like they imagined. But that location on the proverbial highway also gave those three towns something that Jesus is calling out in those words Don read for us this morning. Pride and arrogance and, and that false belief that you've got it made, that, that you're as good as you can be, that, that God has somehow blessed you because of your exceeding Grace and worthiness. Being on the king's highway assured that you were in the in crowd, that you had it made. That's why towns back then fought to bring those travel routes near them, near those towns. It, it meant wealth and prestige. It was good for their collective egos. You can never be called back woods or back wards if you are located on the king's highway. And if you aren't well, it's not unlikely that your town would always be poor and struggling, if not die out altogether. You can even see that throughout our own Midwest as you get off the interstates and drive those smaller back highways and byways. The towns that were bypassed by the interstates by our kind of modern day version of the King's Highway are, are not doing well often. They seem to be almost shriveling up and dead or dying, and in reality many of them are. The same is actually true of our own town, Denver, and its history. In the 1860s, planners for the Union Pacific Railroad, that first transcontinental means of transportation for this growing nation, a literal version of the King's Highway in America, made the decision to bypass Denver. They felt that the mountains to the west of Denver were, were too hard, too difficult to find passes through, and instead they chose to go north about 100 miles through a small, modest little cow town named Cheyenne. Denver's leaders were in a panic. How could this happen? It would, it would be devastating for the town, which deserved the honor much more than that small hick town they fought to the north. But the decision was final, and, and by 1867, the railroad was bringing growth and prosperity to Cheyenne, and Denver was struggling. So those same leaders got together and took matters into their own hands. They formed new railroads, like the Denver and Rio Grande. They built their own tracks to connect not only with the Union Pacific, but to other rail networks. And, and soon Denver was on a growth spurt that would far exceed Cheyenne's. And the same thing happened with the interstates back in the 1950s. For the same reason, the federal government decreed that I-80 would go north, north of us through Cheyenne. And Denver, by the 1950s, was a much larger city than Cheyenne, but they again were in fear of becoming just a, a back roads forgotten place again. So once again, our leaders took matters into their own hands. They developed plans and even began construction of the interstate that we call I-76. It was called Interstate 80 South originally. It was designed to connect us to I-80, cutting through the corner of Colorado into Nebraska. 
They began that and soon the feds announced that they would take over and finish the project and that they were also going to build that north-south I-25 through Denver that is such a dream in rush hour. And Denver's future, at least from a transportation point of view, was secure again. Bethsaida and Chorazin and Capernaum had it good in Jesus' day. A prosperous economy, a cosmopolitan culture, so many things that filled them with a sense of pride and hardened their ears and their hearts to any message coming to them of repentance, calling them away from their glamorous clothes and beautiful homes and saying, put on sackcloth and ashes, calling them to examine their lives and realize their sins and repent, literally turn away from the things that are working against God's will, against God's kingdom, and, and find a new way, find a way that's reconciled with God. No need for that message, Jesus, thank you, anyway. We're, we're doing just fine. Thanks. That really frustrated Jesus. He had been there for two years. He'd been preaching. They had seen miracles. He had healed a blind man very famously in Bethsaida. They were all near that site where he fed the thousands. Yet they didn't respond. And as he's leaving, he condemns them in the same language that the prophets condemned the people in the Old Testament. He says that if Tyre and Sidon, those two Gentile Romanized towns in what's known as Lemadon today, had, had, had acted that way, had heard his message rather, they would have repented. They would have been in sackcloth and ashes. Those two towns known for their vulgarity and excess and godlessness would have responded to him, but, but his hometown, his home region didn't. So as he bids farewell to those towns, to that region that has been his home base for at least two years, his parting words are words of warning, of judgment. And contained within them are the same heartfelt message he's been giving to them, to all of those people passing through on the King's Highway over the years too. Repent, turn back to God, because the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance isn't a message people want to hear. And frankly, the more we need to hear it, the less we want to hear it. A wise theologian once said that repentance is literally the first base of our Christian faith. No matter how much you want to avoid it, no matter how much you think you can skip it, you can't make it to home plate without touching it. Bethsaida and Chorazin and Capernaum were pretty sure that they could just go ahead and skip it. After all, they were doing okay. They didn't really need to hear talk of repentance, of confessing their sin, and, and then that harder part of turning away from it to a new direction. They didn't need repentance. They certainly didn't need a Messiah like Jesus. They were doing just fine, thank you. And that's the prevailing opinion today, not only in our overall culture, but often within the church, too. Harry Denman is, is maybe one of the most important and influential evangelists of the 20th century, and I'll bet you've never heard of him. You see, he wasn't on TV. He didn't hold big crusades in stadiums, although he was a big influence on his friend Billy Graham and made his, helped him make his crusades successful. Harry Denman wasn't even ordained. He, he never attended seminary. Instead, he was an insurance salesman and a college administrator, but, but still his evangelism as just a simple Methodist layperson probably touched more lives than many of the professionals who today claim the title of evangelist for themselves. And he did it by simply talking to people, often one-on-one -on -one whenever the chance arose. In his memoirs, he tells of two of his kind of standard approaches to strike up conversations with people. The first he often did when he was staying in a hotel while he was traveling. He said he'd make it a point of going down to the hotel bar in the early evening. He'd order a soda, he made that clear. And, and when the bartender brought it over in a loud voice so everyone around could hear, he asked the bartender how he could pray for him. Sometimes it would open up a conversation with the bartender, but it almost always ignited a conversation with some of the other people sitting nearby. That, that kind of naturally then turned people's curiosity to that strange question he had asked, and then to a discussion of who Jesus was, what the gospel is all about. But the other approach I think is even more interesting, and it's kind of related to our topic of repentance today. He said that on an airplane, he would be sitting there at some point, as usually happens in the flight after some initial niceties and conversation, he'd ask his seatmate if they thought they were a good person. Hmm. 
Usually after a little hemming and hawing, the answer would be, yeah, I think I'm a pretty good person. Maybe not perfect, but, but pretty good. His next question was a little more pointed. He'd say, do you think you're good enough to make God happy? Do you think that life you're living, the choices that you're making, make God happy? He said most of them would kind of hem and haw again, but, but eventually, usually they would say, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much as good as anybody else. I think God's okay with who I am. Then we'd ask them who they thought the best person alive today was. Now remember, these, this was in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And he said that after, again, some thought, the most common reply he heard was either Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. He'd simply like the good insurance salesman that he was, close the deal. He'd say, did you know that Billy Graham or that Mother Teresa said that they were just a sinner in need of a savior? That even that person that they thought was surely good enough before God on their own merits, by their own confession, was just a sinner saved by grace? Then he'd tell them about Jesus, tell them how they too could confess, repent of their sins, how they could accept the grace of God through Jesus Christ and, and be just as saved, just as much in God's good graces as either a Billy Graham or a Mother Teresa. You know, I'm afraid that all too often we're more like Capernaum or Chorazin or Bethsaida than we care to acknowledge. After all, we hang around good people. We smile. We're pretty nice to our neighbors. We go to church, maybe, but, but just like those three cities that Jesus is warning, our, our pride can sometimes keep us from hearing his message about repenting, of truly looking at ourselves, our lives, our choices, and, and seeing where we fall short of the glory of God, as Paul puts it in Romans, of seeing that sin and failure in our own lives and turning away from it to something better, turning to God and, and his ways of choosing sackcloth and ashes, that Old Testament image of repentance and mourning that Jesus is using here, instead of that veneer that we all often so, so often have that, that says to those around us and, and tries to say to God, no, thanks anyway, I'm just fine as I am. That's the purpose ultimately of Lent, that 40 days that started on Ash Wednesday. Those days that lead us to the cross of Good Friday and the empty tomb of Easter. It's our chance to not forget about first base. To not forget that our true, our restored relationship with God begins with sackcloth and ashes, with repentance and a, a new direction. Only then can this truly joyous journey to Easter, this trip to eternal life, really start. May we all always remember that. May we come together in sackcloth and ashes in order that we might see the true joy of resurrection that awaits us. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, truly, we ask you to hear our humble plea. We confess, God, that so often in our arrogance we think we have it made, that we're doing it all right. God, convict us, convert us, help us see where our choices, our lives fall short of your glory. And remind us, truly, God, that there is grace and mercy awaiting even us when we confess, when we turn back to you. Implant that message today in our hearts, oh God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now I invite you to stand. Let's sing together our closing hymn. Of course, uh, one made famous by those very Billy Graham crusades. Just as I am without one plea. You'll find that on the inserts in your bulletin. The words are also on the screen. Stand as you wish. Let's sing together. Just as I am without one plea. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 6 this morning.
probably don't say it often enough or clearly enough, but God calls you just as you are to come. People have asked me why we don't do altar calls here, and, and I personally came up from an era where I saw altar calls and, and saw often just a, a charade of repentance. God doesn't care so much about the altar calls in church. He cares about the response in your heart. I'm always available if you want to talk about it, but God is calling you through Jesus Christ to new life, simply by your prayer saying, Lamb of God, I come. As we go forth, receive these words of blessing and benediction. O loving and gracious God, we go from this place, our hearts filled with your love, with your message, your spirit in our lives. And as we go, God, we ask you to light our paths and guide our footsteps. Give us hearts to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.